let us stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear from St. Paul, who writes to the Ephesians, as we heard in today's reading. You are strangers and aliens no longer. No, you are fellow citizens and members of the household of God. You are built upon the foundations of the apostles to form a holy temple in the name of the Lord. And we are those living stones that form that temple. And we are living stones from all over the world and we look different and we're some from the river and some from the mountain and some are jagged and some are smooth but somehow we're all fitted together into these columns that form arches to build this holy temple the arches lean into each other and they all crash together except for two things the foundation of the apostles and the capstone of jesus who holds us together in this holy temple to form a place of welcome and hospitality so just a few words from a prayer from Martin Luther King, Jr. Lord, when we reject each other, it breaks your heart. When we are hard-hearted and stony, it breaks your heart. Racism breaks your heart, O oh God. Break our hearts, for we break yours, O oh Lord. Ever-present God, you are called to be in relationship with one another and promise to dwell where two or three are gathered. In our community, we are many different people. We come from different places. We have many different cultures. Open our hearts that we may be bold in finding the riches of inclusion and the treasures of diversity among us. We pray in faith. Amen. Amen. I'd like to call forward now uh, Father Rene Constanza, who is the rector of the cathedral, local Paulus Superior, director of the Catholic Information Center. Thank you, Father Bill. Good evening, everyone. The Paulist Fathers are again this year honoring someone from each Paulus Foundation and Ministry for the Spirit of Hecker Award, named after servant of God Isaac Hecker, who is the founder of the Paulus Fathers. This year's recipient from the Catholic Information Center has been connected to the center, connected to Grand Rapids and the Paulus Fathers, since his childhood. We've been here in Grand Rapids for almost 75 years. In fact, it was at the center, Catholic Information Center, where he and his wife, Margaret, first met. Wow. See, the center happens to be more than just intersection of faith and life. Well, actually, that is the intersection of faith and life. In his ministry, he previously served the Diocese of Grand Rapids as the director of the Secret Secretariat for Parish Life. Today, he serves as a model for networking and a resource broker for us at the center. After the CIC's program and Institute's director, Irene Strom, passed away in January. By the way, Irene was the first recipient of this award from the center. This recipient stepped in with a willingness and generosity to, us, to, act, to help and assist the center staff with setting up programs through the winter and the spring. His connections, his ideas and resources and networks helped the center continue to provide the quality of formation programs that we are known for. The Paulist Fathers and the Catholic Information Center are pleased to announce this year's recipient of the Spirit of Hecker Award, Dan Pearson. Let us welcome Dan. And it's an honor to, in front of all of them here, but also more than 
what, 13 states that are here um, to present to you. Well, actually, Dan will be presented this award, will be honored at this, at this year's second annual Spirit of Hacker Awards. It's an online event, along with the Cathedral's honoree. Everyone can join this online event, which is Saturday, November 6th, starting at 8.30 p.m. The event will honor our deeds from all Paulus ministries and foundations, and will also have a silent auction. Silent auction. It's a dinner with a Paulus of your choice, and they'll fly the Paulus to wherever, whoever wins this auction. And chances to win various raffle prizes for those registered to attend. So if you want more information, those viewing us online, please go to paulist.org slash hacker awards to sign up. And so Dan is here because Dan will be introducing as a resource broker that he is. <laughs> he is introducing to us tonight's uh, talk, the Gallagher talk. Thank you, Father Thank Rene. You. Thank you very much. Father Rene, will they send the winner and their favorite Paulus where they would like to go to have that dinner? That would be the key thing because we would all enjoy dinner with you someplace else. <laughs> thank, thank you, Father Paul, uh, Rene. And um, to learn more about the Paulus fathers and the spirit of Isaac Hecker, as Father Rene said, it's November 6th. And you can bring your favorite drinks and snacks and join Margaret and me and Father Rene for that event. Thank you. In that role of um, networking, um, I uh, had the idea to invite Mickey McGrath to the Catholic Information Center. Now, you have to know is that I first met Sister Thea Bowman in the spring of 1989. And this was just before she spoke to the bishops of the United States at their meeting that June. And she was in a wheelchair at the time. And she did uh, offered a most inspiring presentation. The next person I met was Mickey McGrath. And I, Mickey said to me on May 31st, 2001, <laughs> in this book, one of his first books, he said, to Dan, a pleasure to meet you, Mickey McGrath. <laughs> and I must say, it was and a pleasure, and the rest is history, <laughs> and it was certainly a pleasure to meet Mickey McGrath. Mickey and I reconnected this past year, or two, past couple of years, because we were in the midst of COVID, and we were both trying to survive. Uh, and how do we be, continue to be of ministry uh, in this time of COVID? New models, new ways of doing things. And that's when the idea occurred to me, and I talked to Father Rene and then to Mark, that we needed to bring Mickey McGrath to Grand Rapids. Welcome. Let me do an official introduction. Brother Mickey McGrath paints, writes, and tells stories. Then he travels around the world, from Spain to Grand Rapids, telling the many stories behind what he paints and writes. Brother Mickey majored in art at Moravian College and later received an MFA in painting at the American University. For 11 years, he was an associate professor of studio art and art history at DeSales University, Philadelphia. Since 2009, he has lived and worked in Camden, New Jersey, where he furthered his art education in the context of social justice and finding beauty in the margin. He will be celebrating 43 years as a religious brother in the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales this year. We welcome you to Grand Rapids. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, what do I do? I never saw one so small. Wow. <laughs> Welcome to Grand Rapids, high tech, you know. There we go. Oh, 
Thank you. I think that's it. <laughs> I don't get out much, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the Spain thing, he just got back from Spain. Yeah. A pilgrimage, he can tell you about that. But we're on time. <laughs> but it's a pleasure. I've been looking so forward to being here with you all. And Father Rene has said you've been here 75 years. You look great. <laughs> Must be something in the water here in Grand Rapids. Huh? <laughs> but I just have to warn you all, <clears throat> it's true of everything these days. I have, have so much work I'm always anxious to share. So uh, if you start, if you're half all asleep and your head's on the table, then I'll take that as my cue. It's time to go. But especially when I'm talking about Sister Thea Bowman, I could just go on forever. Um, and But before we get started, there we go. A gentle reminder, everything's copyrighted. If you want, I'm going to explain at the end how you can get uh, re art and reproductions and books and all that stuff. So, um, so don't steal or you're burning hell. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Thea Bowman, here we are. And I was, I'm so thrilled that um, she is a servant of God status. She's on her first uh, legs towards, um, uh, first steps towards sainthood, right? And I'm particularly thrilled because there's, well, I'll get them at the very, very end, but uh, all my favorite saints these days are the servant of God level. <laughs> Dorothy Day and Nicholas Black Elk. And these are the folks that give me hope for, that's what's waiting for us when, the, when we get through this very troubled time we're living in, in both church and country, the world. You know, I just think these are the symbols of hope that the Holy Spirit's sending our way to say, hang in there, I'm with you, you're not alone. And uh, there's such beauty in there. Beauty saves. And I learned that and first learned of Sister Thea. One day, when, back when I was teaching still at the Sales University, I taught art and art history there for 12 years, I guess it was. And, um, but my dad was dying. And it, this was at our home in Philly, Northeast Philadelphia is where I grew up. And I went home one Sunday. We had a hospital bed in the living room. He had hospice care at that point. And I remember it was a December day. And my siblings hadn't come over yet, so it was just me there. And Dad was taking a nap. And I picked up the magazines that were on his coffee table right by the bed there. And um, uh, one in, the, or in U.S. Catholic, it said the last interview with Sister Thea Bohm, and I'd never heard of the woman in my life. She had been dead a year at that point. And I read it, and I thought, wow, who was this person? <laughs> you know, it was just so amazing to me that... Uh, uh, the, her, her spirit of hope. She died at the age of 53. And she said in this interview, she said, I don't, I don't like to use the word dying. She said, I prefer the language of my slave ancestors. She said, I'm going home. And that's what she referred to. And she talked about being a Franciscan and that as a Franciscan, St. Francis wanted all his followers to be troubadours for the Lord. And so her great love of music and her great talent at music uh, is what led her and guided her. And we'll see that in the course of the evening as well. But all the, everything she said, she said, um, she said, the hardest job of being a Christian is to make other people smile. She said, but it's the most important job of being a Christian. And she said, if anyone ever leaves our company feeling worse about themselves, then we have failed in our duties as Christians because we're here to build each other up, not judge each other or condemn each other or any of that. We're here to walk with each other. And that's what she spent her whole life doing. And I would sit, I was sitting there reading this and looking up at my dad and wondering how much longer did he have, you know, all these mysteries and how she was handling her final days with such, and she was, as I said, already dead by the time I even article. And uh, my dad died a few months later and life went on and there I was teaching. And about a year later, I saw the video about her, her story. It was called Her Own Story wonderful documentary and I um, couldn't I remember it was a Thursday night and I couldn't sleep that night because I had so many images in my head it was right at when I'm trying to get out of teaching and try to make my living as a full-time artist and I was painting one bad landscape after another <laughs> and I thought oh this is what a failure this is not going to work and I got up the next morning Friday morning and I just started painting and I didn't stop for two weeks except to eat, nothing gets in the way of meals, right? But, <laughs> but nine paintings rolled out of me in two weeks time in a style very different from anything I'd ever done before. And I look back now and realize that I was possessed by a little black nun and that my job was being given the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, my fi my, my, uh, finally the word of what I was here on earth to do, which was to paint 
and to share the joy of the Holy Spirit through art. And that's why that life's, uh, we, we have enough struggles, don't we know that these days, right? And I believe beauty will heal us. That was Dostoevsky's line, that Dorothy Day's favorite line that got her through life. In the end, beauty will save us. And I didn't know that quote at the time, but I realized looking back now, that's exactly what Thea was teaching me, Sister Thea. So I became um, obsessed with Sister Thea and I started doing presentations about her life and the little bit I knew about her, but each of my paintings that you'll see had a title of a spiritual because the spirituals and, and leading her audiences in song uh, was a crucial part of her ministry. And so I titled these paintings after spirituals and started sending pictures. This is 1992, don't forget. So there's long before digital cameras and all that. So I had multiple sets of pictures made of the paintings and sent them to people that were in the video, archbishops and bishops and church leaders all over the country. I didn't know that anybody, you know? I didn't even know why I was sending them the pictures. <laughs> but in the notes, I was always saying, here's some pictures I did, and I knew they were all friends and admirers, and all of them wrote back lovely notes. Every Archbishop like, Archbishop Law of Boston, who was a very dear friend of hers, and, um, and, I, and they're all saying, oh, good luck. I was like, that's it, good luck. <laughs> and one day, I was, uh, uh, I opened, I answered the phone, and um, there, there was a woman, she said, so Brother Mickey, she said, this is Pat Shelton, and she said, I'm the head of the Office of Black Catholics for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia which I was, uh, you know, where I was living. And so uh, she said, I just opened my mail and your pictures are in my lap, literally. What are we going to do about this? And a half hour later, we had planned a presentation where I would have, I didn't have prints or anything yet. It was the actual paintings. I held them up. She hired a piano player to play the music. And we found a church in North Philly to have the very first presentation which is now probably over a hundred times I've done it around the country. But that first Sunday, before we hung up, we had to plan this thing for a half hour. And before we hung up, she said, Brother Mickey, can I ask you something? I said, sure, Pat. And she said, are you white? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, yes, I am. She said, I thought so. She said, where's this coming from? I said, I don't know, but you can't block the blessings. That's what the Holy Spirit's leading me to, you know? So that was fun. And we planned the thing and not knowing it was Super Bowl Sunday. And um, so we're in this big church, beautiful church in Philly and nobody's there. It was supposed to be 2.30 and a quarter after two and there's not a soul there except my family and friends, you know? And I said to Pat, what were we thinking? You know, we should have picked a different date. And uh, she said, honey, don't worry, they'll be here. And about by 2.30, 25 of there were over a hundred people there that she had got through the Office of Black Catholics. And that was the first of many. And I, as I say, I'd look back, I don't even know what I knew of her then, you know, until a couple years later, I went to, the, who's that piping in? <laughs> um, I, this is her home. I went to, I had, was very blessed to be able to visit Canton, Mississippi, where she grew up and stayed in her home. And that was her bedroom where her fans and devotees had put that sign, Sainthood for Thea Bowman. And I stayed right in there and met her childhood friends and some of the people that she taught. They set it a wonderful program up uh, where in the morning I met with people she grew up with, women. And in the afternoon, it was all stu former students of hers. And they shared their stories and recollections and the things I learned. One woman told me, um, she said, when we would go, if back in the day, she said, until 1966, if we, meaning black folks, Catholics, went to a white church for mass, she said, we were not allowed to go to the communion rail for communion. She said, once all the whites were back in their seats, the priest would come back to us and distribute communion. And I thought, why would anybody want to be part of a church that treated like that? Why would Thea Bowman convert to Catholicism in that world and in that climate? Nothing short of the Holy Spirit. And that's where I get my joy. It's like she rose above uh, the, the racism and, and teaches all of us today how to, how to rise above with her. And that God and Jesus is bigger than uh, awful customs, evil customs and divisive and racism and all those things that we're encountering such uh, you know, way too much these days. Asians being attacked on the streets, Jews being beaten up, you know, it's just, it's, things are out of control, and we need Sister Thea's spirit more than ever, and that's why I'm so delighted to share that with you tonight. So she grew up in this home, I should stay there, I guess, and her, her dad was a doctor, and he went to one of the few schools, graduated in 1920, from one of the few schools in the whole United States that would educate, admit 
black students. So when he got his medical degree, he heard about this town. He was from Memphis originally. And he heard about this town in Mississippi of 10,000, 7,000 of whom were black and not a single white doctor who would treat black people. And it was cotton country. So they were all very, very poor sharecroppers. And so he and another doctor and a dentist set up uh, practice there in Canton. Is that my... Um, oh, oh. <laughs> now, where was I before he distracted um, so they set up practice there and that's where he met his wife who was a, a, a well-known teacher in the area and so they married and um, they couldn't they lived within walking distance of the hospital in Canton when she got pregnant um, she, uh, but he sent her to Yazoo City because they couldn't go as black people to the ho local hospital Yazoo City, which was 35 miles away, was the closest place that admitted black people. And he wanted her, as she was getting closer to delivery time, to be in a safe place. So she went up to Yazoo City. And one day, Christmas week of 1937, she called him and she said, I've gone into labor. And he drove up to Yazoo City. And that's where Sister Thea was born. She was named Bertha after an aunt and then grew up in this home. And so it, I, it was like go, going to the Holy Land for me to, to be in that that, uh, that wonderful <clears throat> home. And so what happened in the day, those days in the deep South, white kids started school every September, black kids didn't go back to school till December because they had to pick cotton. I went, one of Sister Thea's childhood friends, she said, as a little girl, she said, I had to pick cotton, 250 pounds of cotton a week. And she said, we weren't allowed to go back to school till, and there were segregated schools. So the, the horrible schools that the black kids had to go to, but she said, we didn't go back to school till December, you know? And um, so what happened was the Bishop of Mississippi with the whole state was one diocese at that point, said he wanted to open a Catholic parish and a school. And it took three years before they could find anybody to sell them land because not only was it gonna be a black church but black and Catholic was like double dipping into hell, right? <laughs> and they finally found land um, and the township said, you can put a school up. I met one of the early sisters there in the, in the Franciscan sisters nursing home. And I went and they brought me in to meet her. And she said she was one of the, she wasn't the first four, but early on. And she said the sisters were treated just like the black folks, which was their plan. They said we, they, they felt it was the most important so social justice uh, moment of the 20th century and they wanted to be a part of it. And they were there to educate, not to make kids become Catholic or any of that. They said there can be no equal rights until there's equal education opportunities. So three of the sisters were uh, teachers and one was a nurse because they were a nursing community as well. And they went and changed Canton, Mississippi. And this is the church that was built. And sister told me when she went to register to vote, the man looked up at her in 1948 and said, why don't you end loving Catholics, go back North where you belong and mind your own business, get out of town. So they were treated the exact same way as the black people that they had come. She said, we were there to serve. So we were learning from them as well. And we wanted to be, live the life. She said, we boycotted stores that wouldn't serve black people. And, you know, they went through the same uh, awful deprivations. Later in the 60s, when Sister Thea went to register to vote at the city hall, she had to be accompanied by federal marshals because there were so many white people harassing black people that were going in to register to vote. And look what's happening today in Georgia and Texas. And it's like, we're back there. You know, that's what's so frightening. We need Thea, come back. So uh, this is the church. And they were told that you can build a church, but it has to sit far off the road. And you have to put a fence up so nobody knows what's behind there and no signage. And the sister told me a year later, the nuns went out at midnight and tore the fence down and it never went up again. <laughs> but Sister Thea was one of the first kids to show up. Her parents were highly educated people. They were desperate to get her out of the horrible uh, segregated public school system. And that's where the Franciscan sisters came in. Their first building before they could build the actual school was an old Quonset hut, as you see in the upper right picture there uh, from the army. She said they had it brought it in 80 miles and it was like a big one room schoolhouse. She said when it rained, there were holes in the roof. They had to get all the kids down the other end of the building, but it changed those kids' lives. And Thea was so impressed 
She said they were the first white people that were nice to her. Even as a little five-year-old walking home from kindergarten one day, a white woman yelled at her to get off her property and called her the little N-word, you know? And there come these Franciscan sisters who were, she said they were here to teach us. She said, they taught me that I could do anything I put my mind to. Any dream I had, I could make a reality because of the way they taught and ministered. So she became the kid that would stay after school and help them clean the blackboard and all that stuff. And her parents were thrilled that she was finally getting this good education. She was a fifth grader when she started. And um, uh, you can see the sisters up there and, the, and down here on the lower left with all the little kids that they were so delighted. I met one of Thea's um, little school friends who was one of 18 children living in a shack uh, sister told me that most people, it was, they said it was the third world, dirt floors, holes in ceilings, no electricity, no plumbing, dire, dire poverty. And the sisters uh, approached her one day. She said, I was sitting on the front door of our, the shack that I lived in. And the, she said, a nun walked up and a priest in a cassock. She said, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. There were no Catholics in town yet, right? And um, they said, little girl, we're starting a school this September and we want you to be part of it. And she said, my daddy can't afford that. It was a dollar a year tuition. And they said, don't worry about that. We'll take care of that. And she said, she started school. And one of the nuns, that she pointed to her picture on the wall. And she said, she was my dearest mentor. And she said that, um, <laughs> he is so bossy. I can't take it anymore. All day long, this is all I've had. <laughs> uh, now, where was I? <laughs> but anyhow, so this woman, Doris, was her, I think I have her picture in here. But look at this quote, I, I go back here. They, this is what Thea said of the Franciscan. They came into my world and showed me the possibility for life and growth that I have never dreamed of. They showed me that people from different races and cultures could work together and could enjoy it. And this was totally new to her, totally revolutionary. Faith, she said, is not taught it's caught <laughs> and we have to celebrate faith. So she decided as a little girl, I think she was only 10 when she decided to convert to Catholicism. She said she loved, she said it was all the talk when Catholics were coming to town, she said, because they prayed, worshiped statues <laughs> in the minds of everybody and they prayed in foreign tongues because they were, everything was in Latin in those days. And she just loved liturgy. It was liturgy and worship and those things that enthralled her as a kid and attracted her. So she converted and her parents consented to that. But she also said this later, the elders made a deliberate effort to teach me about life, about love, about happiness and joy, about how to deal with insecurity and convince me I was special. How important she said the elders were in that church community where everybody knew each other. She said in the church of the South that she grew up in, it was, you looked out for each other's elderly or the kids and when a parent was sick, you knew who needed special care. She said, you went to church on Sunday and it was an all day event because that's when families came together in a sense of community. And uh, that's not what she experienced when she came North. Old folks used to say, God is my father and my mother, my sister and brother, my pearl of great price, my lily of the valley, my rock, my sword, my shield. God's a God of peace. God's a God of war. God is water when you're thirsty, bread when you're hungry. God is my doctor, my lawyer, my captain in the battle of life, my friend, my king. So this was that friend I was telling you about, Miss Doris O'Leary, and she said that she heard that the house had fallen into repair because there were no descendants, Thea was an only child. So, there, and, uh, so the house was really falling apart. And she said, I remembered a promise I made to my favorite sister, special nun. She said, uh, the sisters always provided breakfast for us. She said, because none of us, we were so poor, we didn't have food. So she said, every morning we'd go to school at 6.30 uh, and the sisters made grits for them every single morning. And she said, when we needed to wash our uniforms, we didn't have laundry at home, you know? So she said, they let us use the, the uh, washing machine in the convent and she said they didn't have a dryer so they put all uniforms in their oven <laughs> <laughs> to dry them off in time for the kids to wear in class that day but there was this special tender care that convinced her so she had moved she heard the wind and she came back to canton from california she said i left my family and grandkids and everything because i promised sister that when i was old enough i would 
turn this start a tutoring center and learning center for the children of Camden to give back what had been given to her. So she was a beautiful spirit. I loved meeting her, uh, and she's no longer there, sadly. But so, at 15, Thea decided she wanted to be a Franciscan sister herself, and her parents would have none of it. They just didn't get this whole nun thing, right? But uh, but also more than anything, they were terrified. She'd have to go off to La Crosse, Wisconsin the mother house of the Franciscan sisters of perpetual adoration. And they had no family in La Crosse. And they said, they're not gonna like you. You know, it's bad enough down here in the South, but up there, you know, when you're totally alone. They, so they were scared to death for her and they said, no. So see, Thea went on a uh, hunger strike <laughs> until they consented and they did. And one of the sisters told me that when the time came, the sisters went to her home to pick her up and her father hugged her one final time. She said, I beg you, don't do this. They're not going to like you. And she said to him, I'm going to make them love me. And she got in the car with the sisters to go to the train station. When I was there, I was like a Holy Land pilgrimage. I went to see everything. I, I said, this is the train station that she left home from. You know, I don't think it's changed much since 1954. But um, in any event, they, she had to lay low in the car. Because in 1954, black girls could not travel in the same car as white women. Whenever they would go by police, she'd have to duck, you know, later. Whenever they would, when, even when she was a nun and living there, she had to call her parents and say, take me to the grocery store. We're doing our shopping. And she'd meet the other sisters. They'd do the shopping. They'd go back in their car. She'd have her parents drive her back to the convent, grown woman. But that's how it was in Mississippi, you know? Just unbelievable. It's hard to believe to us today, but that, but that was the reality, you know? So anyhow... She gets in the trains, and the, uh, this is all in the sisters' annals. I've been to the mother house and their archives. I've read the annals, and it said we put up such a fuss because they wanted her to get in the car for the colored that she wasn't allowed to travel with the sisters, and that she wrote, we put up such a fuss that they relented, and they let us travel north with Sister Thea in the white car. And you can imagine how that must have rattled some of the other passengers, you know. And she went up north through Chicago and arrived in La Crosse and said it was two years before she saw another black face. And one of the sisters told me there was a Native American reservation not far away and she reached out there. And Sister Thea later said she was always the only Catholic in black world and the only black in Catholic world, which set her up as the other. And that's who she wanted to devote her life to reaching out to people who feel like the other for whatever reason, you know. And uh, so that became her life mission. And she learned it through this. <laughs> so she arrives at La Crosse, Wisconsin, at the Mother House. The Turbo University is the school the sisters have there. And this is the Mother House Chapel. Can you imagine? <laughs> Coming from that little house that I showed you earlier in the cotton fields of Mississippi. And this is my new home, right? This big, grand, beautiful building where they have perpetual adoration every day since they were founded in this chapel. And um, I thought, oh, I'm not in Kansas anymore. Huh? <laughs> so this is a, the first painting from that nine part series. It's called Give Me That Old Time Religion. And she was the only black woman to this day, the only black woman that's entered that community. And um, the things she had to put up with, you know, I don't think people necessarily always meant to be racist, but they would just say comments that were totally thoughtless and racist and but she said, I put up with it thinking, God called me to this. I guess I'm supposed to, to be here for it. But notice in this painting, she's leaning one way and the background's going the other. And I have her feet bare to show her simplicity of spirit, which is the gift that she brought to them. <coughs> but she was teaching them as much as uh, she was learning from them. So here she is in her habit. I need a little sip of water here. It's a very good vodka that you did provide. <laughs> Oh, now what? <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm just like this. <laughs> God. Go, just go out there. <laughs> One of the letters she wrote home said, it's awfully chilly up here, and I don't just mean the weather. And that's what inspired this picture here. She's wearing 
the quilts of the, but that's a whole other thing. We did that this morning, actually, the quilts of the Underground Railroad and freedom quilts and how important they are in the African-American community. So I wanted to have her warming herself in there as a memory of home. And here she is with her mother and father. He was cut out of the picture, but um, she said, I wasn't glad I was there, but I felt deep in my heart that God had a reason for calling me and I had to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. So that was her daily life, thinking that. I'm not happy to be here, but I meant, okay, I guess I'm good. I'm, <laughs> um, and, but I have her sitting in the pew and she's holding the monstrance because they're this sisters of perpetual adoration, you know? And uh, I just figured that was a, the Eucharist was a very, very important element in her spiritual growth and development. So she's holding that monstrance a little closer. So in 1958, after she was professed, she was uh, sent to teach at the local Catholic grade school, fourth grade. Parents were up in arms. They didn't want their kids taught by a black woman. This is in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And they said to the principal, we want to have a meeting. And the principal, sister, um, very wisely invited Sister Thea to be at the meeting with these, so that these people could meet her and realize how unique she was and delightful. And they fell in love with her and changed their whole attitude. So just by being herself, she was able to start changing hearts. And she was there for two years, uh, but still always fighting that sense of being the other, being alone there, you know? She enjoyed, she loved the kids. She always loved the kids all her life and teaching. Um, but there was that nagging thing that I want more than this, you know? So in 1960, uh, uh, well, in 1958, she, nine, I guess it was, she went back to Mississippi and lived with the sisters and uh, in the convent. And, and well, I'll show you that in a, in a minute. But it was a different world going back south again. And she once, she said, I wasn't afraid of individual whites that she knew she'd befriend. She said, but I was afraid of the Southern white because she, she knew the mentality, the whole culture. And she would, had been away from it in Wisconsin and now she was immersed in it again. And the bishop wrote a letter, again, I saw it in the archives, asking the sisters, when you take your evening walk after dinner, please don't stray too far from the convent because the white people, civil rights is becoming a, a, a big agenda and the whites were strongly against the blacks and they hated the sisters because of their work with the black folks. So he was, the bishop was afraid for their safety and asked them. So things are starting to, to brew at, in the or very early sixties. And um, as I mentioned, when she went to register to vote, she, um, she had to be escorted by federal marshals. And she um, is, is in this picture, it's, it, it shows how in 1968, she was sent by the community back to Catholic University to get her uh, master's degree and then her PhD in English literature. She loves Shakespeare. She was passionate about that. And so she's finding herself for the first time. And this was when she really became Thea Bowman, away from the strictures of the strict convent life in Wisconsin and the racism of the South. And it, in 1968 at Catholic University, she was said, I was meeting other black religious and I wasn't weird anymore. You know, I wasn't the other, the only. And so she's, there's, you know, at the end of Vatican II, she was turned on by that and liturgy and bringing uh, the African-American spirituals into liturgy and dance and movement. And she was going around giving lectures on the history of that, teaching courses. She's the first person to teach a course in black literature at Catholic University. Um, so she's really kind of in the spirit of the 60s and the women's movement and gay movement and everybody had their movements. And she said it was an exciting time to be on a college campus. And that shows her a new side of Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. And that's what she's doing here, dancing with, she's a sister of perpetual adoration, right? So uh, she's dancing with the Eucharist and it's this little light of mine. She once said, let your light shine, walk your talk. God didn't give you your light just to sit on it. <laughs> she, said, uh, she loved the changes in the liturgy. Make the liturgy come alive, be colorful, be bright. 
we're talking about freeing the spirit here. And that's what she felt, you know, liturgy becomes so, and it still is in so many cases, and just kind of a dull, lifeless, routine thing that people went to out of obligation. And she's trying to shake life into people again. Take a fresh look at this. Listen to some black music at mass, you know, listen to something that you're not used to, to kind of let you see what the Eucharist is really about, what Christ is about. And it's not about, you know, you better get the mass on Sunday or I'll be in sin and all that stuff. So when she was there in Canton, she was there for eight years and she formed a choir for the kids. She's starting to teach the teaching. She said the eighth grade boys especially were starting to get angry as time's going on in the 60s. And she was teaching the teachings of Martin Luther King and peaceful resistance and peaceful demonstrations. And she formed a singing group and they made a recording, Songs of My People, I think it's called. And this is what she said in the introduction to that album. Listen, hear us. While the world is full of hate, we sing songs of love, laughter, worship, and wisdom, justice, and peace, because we are free. So she wants everybody to free their spirits, free, their, free your, from your old practices and traditions, and don't be afraid of the new, you know, always move forward. Oops. So in 1965, um, the pastor, who is the tall guy in the center there, the white guy in the white shirt, uh, invited Martin Luther King to preach at Holy Child Jesus church and he shook every parishioner's hand after after he preached the pastor um sent him on his way you can see andrew young the other great civil rights worker on the far right there um and this is at the front door of holy child jesus church and the pastor uh, blessed him and sent him on his way and so this was like history in the make sadly thea was not there <laughs> Uh, because she had to go home to the mother house in the summer back in the day. That's what nuns did, you know, to work on their own college degrees or master's degrees. So she wasn't even in town when this great event happened. But this was the convent. And when she was sent back there, it was state law in Mississippi that blacks and whites could not live under the same roof. And the bishop interceded with the governor. He said, this is how we do it in the convent. She has to live in the convent with the other women. You know, it, it, we have, it can't, you have to change the law and you wouldn't do it. So they built her bedroom. They built an addition on under its own roof. <laughs> and that's how they bent the law. So that was, so she wasn't living under the same roof as the other sisters. Isn't that just crazy? Nuts, you know? And it's just uh, hard to believe, but that was just the way it was. And so shortly after uh, Dr. King was there, about a month later, I think I'm told, um, there was a big rally. Freedom riders from all over the country were going to the South to uh, work at voting rights and to get people interested in civil rights, you know, joining Dr. King's movement. And they were called Freedom Riders because they were going down on buses. Uh, and so a thousand of them came to Canton. It was, had all been prearranged. And when they got there, the township said, you can't do this because you're just causing trouble. You know, so Holy Child Jesus opened up its gymnasium. That's what you see in the picture there. And a thousand, and then the annals, the sister wrote, um, we, this is a very frightening time, but we're, we're loving it. She said, we're exhausted because the, all these freedom riders arrived after being turned away from the city. And she said, <clears throat> so we opened up the convent and because the police were coming with dogs and tear gas, to break up the crowds and we were bringing them into the convent and feeding them and she said we haven't slept in 36 hours because we're just doing laundry around the clock and she said cameras from around the world are watching this and she said we feel like we're in the most exciting time in the church that this is where we're supposed to be the bishop of mississippi had sent word around to all pastors saying um if uh, if you don't integrate your parishes you will be excommunicated unbelievable now they do it if you're a democrat but back then <laughs> back then it really had had some pulled some weight meanwhile the bishop of alabama called the heads of the nuns religious orders and said if any of your nuns come down here and march with dr king you tell them to keep on walking because they're not welcome in alabama so at the church you know there was real mixed signals going on down there in the in the deep south in the church so anyhow back to the big rally uh, so all these thousand people had nowhere to go. Holy Child opened up its gymnasium, the building there. I feel like that's holy ground. And to Sister wrote in the annal, she said, um, we've opened the convent. And she said, and last night we had the miracle of the loaves and fishes because we fed 800 people sleeping on our gymnasium floor and we never ran out of 
sandwiches and Kool-Aid. We don't know where it was coming from, but they just, it just kept flowing. So they just said, this is the most special time in, in church history and, and, and the social justice era. So I just love that. I, I, again, that the parish, by the way, I think the parish is open, but the school has closed. And so timed with this is uh, Vatican II and nuns are allowed out of the convent for the first time. And they're showing, this is look what they do. They all go south and they're marching with Dr. King. Um, who said you can't mix religion and politics, right? <laughs> and be a good moral Christian. That's what we do, right? So it was all, so if you ever see the march across the Pettus Bridge, it's nuns right up front of the crowd, bishops, priests, brothers. And, and I gave a talk a couple of years ago, I forget where I was, uh, but a guy came up afterwards. He said, that's my pastor, the guy in front. He said, he's always telling us how he would go down south and march when he was a seminarian uh, for, with Dr. King. And this picture I just found recently, this, this is a civil rights march as well. And look at all those religious that are there. Cardinal Law of Boston, this is where he formed himself as a bishop, marching, you know. And he and Thea Bowman became good friends at that period in, the, in their lives. And last year when Representative John Lewis died, and we heard so much of this, his quote, never be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. That that's what this is the work of God, you know. It's not staying home and being nice. It's uh, the work of social justice demands more than that, you know. And so look at the priest right up there. This was the anniversary next to Coretta Scott King there. Um, and they had the, the anniversary march every year over the bridge. Martin Luther King said, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. Whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And Pope Francis, who's a big fan of Martin Luther King, said, I think of the words of Martin Luther King, when you rise to the level of love, to its great beauty and power, you seek only to defeat evil systems. He wrote that in Laudato Si. And Thea's word was, doesn't matter if you're scared, just keep on stepping. And that became her motto for the rest of her life. She'd always tell people, just keep on stepping, put one foot in front of the other and you just got to ignore uh, the barking of the dogs. She said, God is present in everything, in the universe, in creation, in me, and everything that happens to me, in my brothers and sisters, in the church, in the Eucharist, everywhere. Praise the Lord with your whole heart, mind, and spirit. Freeing your mind and imagination is to see the good things the Lord has done for us. Break out of the rules, you know, the black and white world of rules and regulations. That's not what Jesus was about. It's about the imagination and not being afraid to use your imagination, to be yourself, you know, and not obsess about sin and judgment. And that's just, we're hearing so much of that about God. That's not the God I want to spend eternity with. That's all I'm saying. You know, <laughs> you know, it's about loving yourself and accepting your failures, your weaknesses as well. So. After she got her uh, degrees, she got first her master's degree and then her PhD, as I said, at Catholic U, and she was sent back to Viterbo University to teach where she spent the next nine or so years of her life. And that's what we see here every time I feel the spirit. When the sisters stopped wearing a religious habit, um, they had a modified one for a while, and then she started wearing African dresses and, and turbans and scarves and whatnot. And so we see the wind of the Holy Spirit just uh, blowing her free, free to freedom. She was called the most powerful woman on campus, and she was never held any administrative position, but people flocked to her classes. You know, she was just became this renowned teacher. She not only of English literature, Shakespeare, the debating club, anything to do on stage, drama. She loved all of that. You know, she just loved being on stage. <laughs> and um, so she became this real force of energy at Viterbo. She said, teach me, I will learn, I want to learn. I want to keep learning until I die, but I also want to teach. I want to accept your gifts. Please share your treasures with me, but I also want to share my treasures with you. That's what she'd say at the start of the first day of class to her students. I was told she'd come in and uh, she said, she'd start singing a song, English class, right? And she'd start sing a spiritual. And she said, I gotta get you kids motivated, especially you white kids. <laughs> You know, just to get, the, get them seeing things differently. And she said, don't be afraid to express your opinion. She said, it's, it's neither right nor wrong. She's just trying to get everybody to own their true selves. 
She said, maybe I'm not making big changes in the world, but if I've somehow helped or encouraged somebody along the journey, then I've done what I'm called to do. All the colors and hues and tones that God has created are beautiful. So I have the sheep down there, not just white sheep, like we're always seeing, but sheep in the colors of the people of the world, human flesh sheep uh, and the rainbow. She said, we're not alike. Our diversity is our richness. Our diversity is our gift to one another. Not something to be feared. So in 1979, she asked the community if she could leave the turbo and go back home to Mississippi because she was an only child. Her parents were elderly and not well, physically well. And she thought, I need to be near them. And she moved right back into her home. Their convent was just a few blocks away, but she got permission to move uh, back to her house. And her best friend, Sister Dorothy, whom they called Dort, um, uh, lived in the convent nearby. And the bishop at this time asked her to start the Office of Intercultural Awareness. And so she got a car and she was driving all over Mississippi. Then she'd hop over to Louisiana and Alabama, all over the South, giving talks on diversity at schools, Catholic and public schools. And she'd get the kids up singing and dancing and teach them history as a, in a, as a result. And English, you know, always in, the, in there. And then adults, of course, and, and the changes of Vatican II. She loved all that, liturgy, anything. And so everywhere she went, she'd get people up singing and dancing. And that's what this picture uh, shows us. Um, and I, this related to me when I learned that because I, as I mentioned, I grew up in Philly and the section of Philly I grew up in was called the Lily White Northeast. And I was scared to death going into summer between eighth grade and freshman year of high school, which is an all boys high school called Father Judge. And it was run by the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales, of which I'm now a member. If you told me that summer I was going to be an Oblate someday, I had a uh, I don't know what, but um, in any event, I had a knot in my stomach because I thought, I can't play sports. I'm so shy and self-conscious. I'm what a disaster. Can't we please have homeschooling, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, the only thing I could do was art and they didn't have art class. And a couple of weeks before uh, school started, I'll never forget this. A Saturday morning, I came down and my dad was at the, pap at the kitchen table reading the paper. And he said, I'm reading an article here about art classes for young people downtown every Saturday at the Moore College of Art. Do you think you'd be interested in that? And three hours later, we were downtown signing me up for art classes that changed my life. Because so you don't think I was just a pathetic little nerd. I, <laughs> the fact that I was able to finally acknowledge this gift and learn how to do art freed me up so that I made it through high school just fine without all the fears and trepidations that I had. But that's what I think another reason that I was drawn to Thea to be the other, which is how I felt I was, and um, to be in the lily white Northeast, you know? And I was allowed to go downtown by myself on the L. And all these kids, I, I, not only was I learning how to paint and use charcoal, I was doing it along with black kids from North Philly, and Jewish kids from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and Puerto Rican kids, and meeting kids I never would have met in the lily white Northeast world. That's boring. White people can be pretty boring, as you know. <laughs> and so I, it was so eye-opening. And that's what this picture represents, that through music. For me, it was through art, but uh, it was how beauty brings us all together. She said, bring people into situations where they can share your treasure, your art, your food, your prayer, your history, your traditions, the coping mechanisms that enabled you to survive. So she also in the early 80s was the co-editor and creator of Lead Me, Guide Me, the African-American Catholic hymnal. And, um, and she wrote a whole preface to there. If you ever got your hands on a copy, they, GIA is now publishing a new version, but she wrote a beautiful essay on the history of uh, Black African-American sacred music. And it's just lovely, very historical, very instructional. So in 1984, in March, she was what, 52, I guess, or I mean 47. And she um, went to the doctor in March and found out she had breast cancer. And in uh, the summer, she was in the hospital in the room next to her mother who was getting sicker and sicker. And in November, her mother died. And in December, her father died. So 1984 was like the toughest year of her life. 
But you know what she said when the doctor said to her, I have three months to three years to live. She said, I'm going to live till I die. And that became her motto the rest of her years. And so that's what we see in this picture here. It's called Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And she would continue. She's now getting national attention, traveling all over the country, giving talks and workshops and undergoing chemotherapy and um, wearing her beautiful African dresses and turbans and whatnot. And what she would always do with the crowds, you know, with a thousand people in the audience and they'd be cheering and she'd come out on stage and she'd say, "We're well, are you with me, church? That was always her opening line. And they'd all hoot and holler. And she'd say, we're all in this together, whether we're black or white, male or female, clergy or lay or bald. And she'd whip off her <laughs> turban because she said, everybody knows I have cancer and they're not going to hear a word I have to say because they're going to be thinking, oh, she looks awful or, <laughs> you know, is she going to make it through the talk? And she said that was her way of kind of just, just get it out, deal with it, you know, and listen to my real message. You know, we'll get through this together. And that's what we kind of see in this picture here. She's speaking to the darkness of fear um, race, all the hatreds, and in her case now, cancer. But the pillar of light is the light of Christ. And that she's preaching to the darkness about the light of Christ that's always with, that's stronger than any darkness. You know. She said, I don't make sense of suffering. I try to make sense of life. I try each day to see God's will. I pray. I don't despair because I believe God leads me and guides me and I can reach out for God's hands. Lord, let me live until I die. If that prayer is answered, how long really doesn't matter. Live for the day. You know, St. Francis de Sales always said that. Let go of yesterday, it's over and done and we're all worried about tomorrow and we can't do anything about tomorrow, you know? Um, so we said, live in the present moment. That's where we're gonna find peace. And that's what beauty does for us, art and music, and helps us live in the present. And that was the message. So she went into remission. And during that time, she was on 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace. And it was one of the most repeated shows ever. This was 1987. And you can see it on YouTube now. I, um, I saw it at the mother house, you know, in the archives. They had the tapes of it. And um, it's a wonderful interview. She was sassy and he went down there for hours, you know, to record and it had to be edited down to a 20 minute interview to be shown on TV, which CBS ended up showing two more times. There was such public demand for it. And um, anyhow, it starts, they're sitting at her kitchen table and at home you saw in the beginning, that's where she spent her last years. And, um, and he says to her, Sister Thea, he said, why aren't there more Sister Theas in the world? We need you desperately. And she said, oh, Mike, Ask, ask my friends and they'll tell you, one is more than enough to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, what is it keeps you going? And she said, every morning I look in the mirror and I say, black is beautiful. And she said, I wanna hear you say it, Mike. And he says, black is beautiful and asks her another question, which she politely answers, but then says to him, I wanna hear you say, I'm still waiting to hear you say black is beautiful like you really mean it. And she has them going and the sisters told me they heard from the people back at CBS in New York in the editing room, they're like, oh, they were afraid that, you know, because they, they apparently Mike Wallace was a real diva, you know, it was tough to work with. And they said he is never going to want that. He, they said it was the only time in all his years when 60 Minutes said he insisted that the other person looked better than him. He fell in love with Sister Thea. And he said she was the most captivating person he ever interviewed. And at one point in the interview, he turns to her and says, are things different now than when you were a little girl? She said, let's go for a walk. And it's, you see them walking, leaving that house I just showed. Um, I think it was white at the time, not blue. But um, in any event, they go up the street. There's a cemetery. And she said, isn't this lovely? And you can see a guy in the background on a tractor cutting the lawn. And, um, and he said, yeah, it's pretty. She said, well, let's go around the hedge. And it's trash cans and weeds. And she said, that was the white cemetery. She said, this is the black cemetery. This is 1987. So she said, uh, you can see... <laughs> You know, we still have a lot of work to do. You know, we have come a long way, but there's so much more to do. And she, that's where I come in as a Franciscan sister. You know, that's, that's my ministry to help heal these social ills, basically. You know, they weren't ex exact words. But it's just, you just see, you know, her, her sense, her, her very being was tied up with that. And shortly after that interview, um, she, um, uh, when cancer came back and it was in her bones, and it caused her great agony. She was traveling like a hundred 
speeches a year, um, uh, getting honorary degrees from all over. And um, so, but she turned her sickness into ministry. He said, this is, but I have it. And she said, I can relate to people in a different way. She said, especially little kids that come up to me who are terrified because their mothers or grandmothers have just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And she said, because I've had it, I know how to talk to them differently, you know? So she, everything became ministry. And this is one of my favorite quotes of hers. When I hurt, I like to sing some of the old songs. I find that prayer and song take me beyond the pain. She said, I'm more at peace. I love people and people have love for me. The love they have shown me during my illness, their human love, is somehow a manifestation of the love God bears me. Because I'm sick and needy and dependent, people are more willing to tell me that they love me, and I'm more willing to tell them that I love them. The love between us is healing. Beautiful stuff. I don't know if I could say that in that pain uh, position that she was in. <coughs> this particular painting, excuse me, was done uh, by for Boston College. They had the uh, Alhana Intercultural Student Center named for Thea Bowman. And so they commissioned this painting to have her. So she's in her wheelchair. And I was insisting on putting that in there because um, she was using her illness, her reality, her truth um, as her ministry to, to preach the gospel. So I thought that was an important element. And she's holding the Franciscan cross, you know, that Francis of Assisi saw, the San Damiano cross. Um, but you can see it's a black Jesus on there. So she had to cut back drastically on her speaking schedule as things are getting worse. And the bishops were always after her to come speak at their annual uh, meeting. And she said, no, I'm too sick. Well, finally, she said to Dort one day, call those bishops and tell them I can come. She said, I've been feeling pretty good lately. So Dort told me when I first met her, Sister Dorothy, that um, the day came for them to leave Mississippi. It was in Seton Hall, New Jersey that year, the bishops meeting, and that she was racked with pain. She was in agony. And Dort said, you better cancel. And she said, no, I promised them I'm coming, so I'm going. And so she said, they, off they flew. Everything was wrong, air conditioning, flight delays. She said, you name it. She never complained, a single word. And they got into this auditorium at Seton Hall with 400 bishops or so uh, sitting there. And they hadn't provided for handicapped accessibility onto the high stage. And so they had to find four or five men to lift her in her wheelchair and on, onto the stage and wheeled her over to the podium where she just started singing, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. And she spoke for 45 minutes and gave the speech of her life. She had been doing workshops for priests all over for years, because she said, white priests really need help with preaching. <laughs> and so she loved to teach them how to preach with a more black uh, passion and vigor, you know? Um, so she preached to the, the bishops that day for 45 minutes and um, shared with them. She said, you're always telling us we're a family, yet we don't act like family in the church. You know, and she did it without anger or judgment. She wasn't finger pointing, but she pointed out, she said, when too often in church, we're in separate rooms. Women are over here and men and clergy and bishops. And she said, bring us all together. That's what this is supposed to, what's what church is supposed to be. And at the end of her speech, she started uh, singing, we shall overcome. And the bishop started singing along with her. And you can see the expression on her face. And you hear her say to them, okay, if you're going to sing, let's do it like we did it back in the day. And she gets them and she said, no, I want you to join arms like this. And then she says, you got to move together to do this. <laughs> but she has the bishops holding hands. And she said, this is how we did it in the marches because so brothers and sisters couldn't be separated when the dogs came and the water cannons and she said, and they stood, and the bishops of the United States crying their eyes out, singing, We Shall Overcome, and swaying back and forth together. And it's the most incredible moment you could watch. That's also on YouTube, so look for it. And um, th at the end of her speech, they presented her with a dozen red roses. And don't forget, she's in pain. You'll never know it when you see this, that, but she was in agony, physical agony the whole time. But she held the roses up and she said, I accept these roses in honor of your mothers and grandmothers and sisters and aunts and your friends or any woman in your life who loved you into the episcopacy and the priesthood and taught you how to be Jesus. And they cheered her on for it, you know? 
And so um, that's what we see here. She was in a wheelchair, but I have her walking on water. This is the very first painting I did in my nine part series. And uh, I always say I have her walking on water because that was her first miracle toward sainthood that she got the bishops to laugh. <laughs> I met, I, uh, bishops aren't a crowd I hang out with, and there aren't any left anymore who would have been there. This was 1989. Uh, but I met one once a, a couple of years ago, and I said, were you there? He said, oh, yeah. He said, I was there just about 10 years ago. And um, he said, he said, Mickey, you could not believe, he said, most of those guys, if that was their own mother on the stage, they would not show an emotion. He said, she had them in the palm of her hand. He said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, the hair on my arms was standing up. He said, there was like electricity. They adored this woman. And they said, uh, and he said, every year since before the bishop's meeting, I pray for a Thea Bowman experience. And we haven't had one since. But my favorite story is from Tom Roberts, a journalist for the National Catholic Reporter. And in one of my talks, he came up and told me it was at his parish in Silver Spring, Maryland. And he came up afterwards and he said, what you didn't see in the video clip, is what happened after she was done. He said, I was there covering that, uh, one of the few lay people in the room uh, for the National Catholic Reporter. And he said, as they were wheeling Sister Thea out of the auditorium, the bishops parted. He said, it was like the parting of the Red Sea, like an honor guard. And they were pushing her wheelchair between them and they were genuflecting as her chair came in front of them. And I started crying. I said, I never heard that. And he said, it's true. He said, I turned to the man next to me and said, we're looking at the future church. And I said, well, what happened? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he said, I still believe that firmly. He said, that's what's waiting for us when this messy time's over. And this is a why this is Pope Benedict was still Benedict, uh, Pope at the time. I remember it was before Francis, but he, um, he said, I firmly believe that's what, that's the church that, that Thea is leading us to. And that's where I've gotten my hope ever since. Because it's true, it's Thea Bowman and all the under, other wonderful servants of God that are on their way to sainthood that are saying, another baby step, come on, we'll, we'll get through this together, this ugliness, and uh, things will change. So she said, once said, I can't preach in the church, women can't preach in the Catholic church, but I can preach in the streets, in the neighborhood, in the home, in the family, and preaching done in the home brings life and meaning to the word preached in the pulpit. She said to the bishops, I am beautiful. What does that mean? It means I am caring. It means I respect myself. It means I am confident. Also to the bishops, how can we work together so that all of us have equal access to input, to opportunity, to participation? You know what she's talking about there? The synodal church. There she is in 1990 saying exactly what Pope Francis is fine. It was supposed to be one of the ideals of the, of the Vatican councils that kind of got lost in the shuffle <laughs> since 1965. And now Pope Francis is trying, this isn't new, it's, it's supposed to have been happening. And uh, that's what she was talking about already. And now, and here we are. So get to those synod meetings and speak your mind without fear. So this is Sister Thea's death. She died on March 30th, 1990 at her family home in Canton. And uh, this uh, painting is called Deep River. And my favorite story about Sister Dorothy shared with me what it was like. Some of the sisters had gone down from the mother house, especially the nursing sisters who were tending to her medical needs. And she said her childhood friends were everybody, you know, she was never alone. Um, <coughs> she said bishops and different people were flying in from all over to say farewell to her and all thinking they were bringing her comfort. And she said they were all leaving saying, she made me feel better than I thought I was gonna do for her, you know, up to the end. And, um, but my favorite story is from Dan Johnson Wilmot. When Thea announced that she was leaving the college to go back South, they were in search of a new music teacher. She was not in the music department. It was just a happenstance. And this guy, Dan, took on the music department uh, head of the music department position. And he said, had I known that it meant leading the gospel choir that Thea had formed called the Jubilee Singers, I never would have taken the job. He said, because it's a whole different type of expression and music uh, conducting and leadership. And he said, I, he said, and is, this is what he said to me, I was an uptight white guy until I met Sister Thea. And he said, I would call her before concerts 
to talk me off the roof. You know, how do I do this? How do I do this song or that song, you know? And they became very close friends. And she said, you're like my big brother. And he said, you're like my sister. So that's what they called each other, you know? And so three weeks before she died, he had the choir from Viterbo at Xavier University. I forgot to mention that. She had started the Black Catholic Studies Institute at Xavier University, where she taught preaching classes and history of Black literature and all that. <clears throat> that's still active today. But anyhow, he said we were at Xavier to do a concert. And he said, I decided to make a detour out of town on the way back to Wisconsin. And we stopped in Canton to sing for Thea. And he said, the bus pulled up in front of the house and I panicked. He said, because the bus looked bigger than the house. And he thought, where am I going to put these 40 college kids? And he said, we got in the living room. He said, there were everybody standing like this. Her bedroom was, I showed you in the, that side. So it was all on the same floor. It was the next room over. And he said, we started singing a song and Thea yelled, I can't listen to this through a wall. I have to be in the room. And he said she was in such pain and discomfort. It took a half an hour just to get her from one room into the next and to get her situated comfortably on the cushions and the pillows and whatnot. And he said, we started singing again. And he said about the third song into it, she just broke down crying at the emotion of it all because she couldn't join in. She didn't have the strength. And he said, we sang a few more songs and said goodbye. You couldn't hug her because of the bone cancer and the pain. And uh, he said, I told her, he said, we're going to stop at McDonald's for lunch on the way out of town to, before we head up the highway to Wisconsin. Um, they had a long trip ahead of them. So he said, sure enough, we're sitting there with, at McDonald's. And he said, I was by the window and this car pulled up. And he said, the rear window rolled down. It was Sister Thea. She had Sister Dorothy get her in a car and drove her over to the McDonald's. And he said, I didn't say a word. I motioned to the choir and the kids, 40 college kids. I cry when I hear, so I'll share this. Surrounded the car and sang Deep River. And he said, there were no words exchanged. He said, so you just went like this and the window rolled up and she was driven off and she died three weeks later. And she had her, all her funeral plans mapped out to a T and she had him singing Deep River. He had a magnificent voice at, um, at, at her funeral. And he, the night that I was first in Canton, I forgot to share this. Um, I was there to do my presentation with the music and all. And I got out there and I panicked. I thought, who am I to be telling? These are the people who lived with her and worked with her and taught with her and were taught by her. And I, I, I don't, what did I know about her? I felt like, who am I to be coming and telling her story? And one of the sisters said to me, we need to hear it from people like you because you're affirming what we knew all along, you know, it just means more to us to hear the impact she's had on other people. So I, that made me feel better. But there was a blizzard that night. And I thought, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> 250 people showed up in a blizzard because she is so esteemed and loved in the town of, uh, of uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. And so many people told me she saved my kid's life. She, they had her for English class and she just took them under, she just had that way with people, changed lives, you know, just by her, herself. And so Dan sang Deep River that night because he sang it at her funeral and he wore an African shirt. He said, I got it special for her funeral. I haven't had it on since. So he wore it that night at the concert. But that's what the, this painting is, her uh, Deep River, crossing the Deep River. This is I'll Fly Away and it's her spirit rising up from its, um, her deathbed to go home to heaven, to cross the river. She used to tell groups, I already said, didn't I? Um, I forget now. <laughs> but anyhow, when she had these big groups, she'd say, um, are you with me? We're all in this together. Whether you're black or white, male or female or bald and show off her bald head. So in this, that's what inspired this painting because she's becoming her true self and her hair is kind of growing back in this picture. And that's where my love for quilts came. You know, In one of her, in her last in recorded interviews, she um, is lying in bed with an Afghan, and that's where I got this notion of, of quilts. But I found out that <coughs> quilts are significant in the African-American community because slaves were not allowed. It was illegal to have a headstone or grave marker of any kind. So when a loved one died, they would add another patch on the family quilt. And it was a way to memorialize people and tell story through quilts. And uh, I never knew any of that until my research here. And Thea always said it was her grandfather that taught her about slavery. When she was a little girl, she said, it was my grandparents that taught me the spirituals. Music was at the heart of everything for her. And she said, but, and he always said, the worst part of being a slave is having chains around your ankles. Um, but even worse is when you have chains around your heart. 
And he said, all people, no matter what color they are, have chains around their heart. So she said from the time she was a little girl, she wanted to, grow, that's what she wanted to do when she grew up, to be somebody who would help people break the chains around their hearts and just love who they were, you know? Powerful stuff. So here's the final painting in my initial series, uh, We Shall Overcome. And she's in um, her uh, black and white colors again. That's just like the first painting in her traditional habit, but kind of rearranged differently, huh? A little different feel to it. And um, I shared these, I remember years ago, early on, uh, I was going all over sharing the paintings and the pictures and telling the stories as I knew them then. And I was at a school in Virginia, in Northern Virginia. The whole school, first through eighth grade was in this auditorium. And a little boy, they opened it up to questions and a little boy put his hand up and asked me, second grader. And he said, brother Mickey, he said, Sister Thea looked real skinny in the other pictures. Now she looks kind of big. And I thought, I had never given that a thought. You know, I thought, out oh, the mouth of babes, right? I said, oh, that's because she's been eating at the heavenly banquet. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, okay. <laughs> but notice her the two color arms. I just did that to break up symmetry. I, I'm not big on rules and symmetry and all that stuff. Uh, so, but I found out later when she was with children, she always said, God gave us five fingers for a reason to remind us there's five kinds of people in the world, black, brown, red, yellow, and white. And you mustn't leave home without your hands or you'll forget one of God's children. Oh. Yeah, beautiful. So it's that whole variety of color thing there. People are looking for sources of hope, courage, and strength. I think all of us in the church are supposed to be that kind of person for each other. I bring myself, my black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to become. That's what she brings to the church. That's what she's talking about. And that all of us bring our true selves to the church. So in commemoration of the 25th anniversary of her death, I was invited to the mother house. I was thrilled to, be, um, to go and I created this picture called Brother, Son, Sister Thea. And it uh, was inspired by a famous story of St. Francis and St. Clair having a beautiful spiritual direction encounter in the woods and the people in the neighboring village saw the woods glowing and they thought, oh my God, the woods are on fire. And they raced in and it weren't on fire at all. It was just Francis and Claire having this beautiful holy conversation that was filled the woods with this heavenly glow. So that's what they're doing here. I just bumped St. Claire out of the picture and uh, replaced her. <laughs> Figured she didn't mind. She was a humble person. And so this is... Um, uh, an image I made a couple years ago for, for myself. It's called Saints and Prophets for a New Pentecost. And that's what it refers to what I was saying earlier. It's a mandala. I do a lot of mandala workshops and things. Uh, that's a way to pray with, with color and shape and to meditate. And, um, but in any event, it's my four favorite servants of God on the way to sainthood. Up top is Thea Bowman. On the right is Dorothy Day. On the bottom is Venerable, so he's a little step above uh, Augustine Tolton, the first recognized African-American priest uh, who's up for sainthood. And what a story he has, I'll have to come back. <laughs> and on the left is Nicholas Black Elk and my introduction to Native American and indigenous people. And we're searing more with the boarding school history and you know all the horrors we did in the name of the American bishops in the South ignored the rules from Rome that condemned slavery said you cannot buy and sell people it's immoral but somehow the american catholic bishops thought eh, they're not talking about us we can still have slaves we just have to treat them nice that was their idea so you know just saying and the same happened with native american people and the boarding schools and the horrors going on there that are still coming to the surface all the time and i just heard today that i guess you all that pope francis announced he's going to canada on a reparation trip because of the horrible things done to the indigenous people of Canada. Sister Thea said, the word of God became incarnate. We are called to preach that word day by day by day in our homes, in our families, in our neighborhood, to bear witness, to testify, to shout it from the rooftops with our lives. If you much preach and sometimes you can't use words you just preach by being yourself you know that's the franciscan way and so this picture was a christmas card for the carmelite sisters the monastery in baltimore maryland 
who back in the early days of Black Lives Matter, you may remember the name Freddie Gray, one of the black people who was killed at the hands of the police. It caused all kinds of social unrest in Baltimore and riots. And so the sisters, as a way to uh, find calm in the midst of that, commissioned a Christmas card. And they said, we'd like a ho holy family, a black holy family. And if you can make it look like Baltimore somehow, that'd be great. So this was the card. And you'll notice uh, St. Joseph is wearing the purple and white jersey of the Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> And they're standing on the uh, a classic Baltimore street. Jesus is holding a sunflower as a symbol of hope and joy, a red flower as a symbol of the passion, and a poinsettia as a symbol of Christmas. Martin Luther King said, love is the greatest force in the universe. It is the heartbeat of the moral cosmos. The one who loves is a participant in the being of God. I don't know if you remember this, but back in the early 90s, the American bishops petitioned Pope John Paul II to create a special status of sainthood for Martin Luther King. Since he wasn't Catholic, he couldn't be canonized in the Catholic tradition, but they said, can we please come up with a special designation? Um, uh, and, and John Paul wanted to do that for Martin Luther because he said how important he was in church history to point out the necessary reforms and that, that made him a saint. So we're in a whole new world. We don't hear those positive stories enough, do we? We just hear all the negative stuff. I mean, there's plenty of that, but there's plenty of positive too. So we just got to hang on to hope. And uh, if you want to learn more, this is a wonderful website, sistertheabowman.com, and that'll update you on the progress of her canonization process. She's now servant of God, as I said, and that, that was um, initiated by the Diocese of Jackson, Mississippi. The sisters vote it and they were voting for years that we pursue this, but they felt it would mean more coming from the people of uh, the African-American Catholic community of Jackson. So that's how it got started there. And these are some books for you to read. Um, the second one in Thea's Song was written by Sister Charlene Smith, who was a classmate of Sister Thea's and the Franciscan sisters. And um, the, one, the third one in is out of print. That's my book. Not out of print because it was so popular, just... Uh, <laughs> And the third, the one on the end is uh, by uh, Father Maurice Nutt. He's a redemptorist priest who was a student of Thea's uh, uh, preaching at the Xavier Institute. And he's now a postulator for her cause. So he's one of the big experts on Thea. And it's a wonderful biography. It's short and very readable. And then what first one there, Sister Thea Bowman, Shooting Star. I'm not sure if it's still in print, but it's a, really a collection of her writings more than a biography. Yes, Thea. What, what is available? Your book. Oh, is it really? Yeah, Orbis has made it available. Oh, how much they charge it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm getting out of anything out of that. I got my lawyer on the phone there. <laughs> and here's uh, my posters that I made years ago, and these are available. 22 by 34 posters if you go to so the SalesianShop.com. Um, and I'm thinking of redoing my book, the one that, uh, um, and adding a lot of the new pictures and stories that I, so keep an eye for that. My next book that will be coming out in the next few months is called Madonnas of Color. So it's all uh, black and Latina Madonnas. I think that's it. Yeah, you wore me out. I'm done. <laughs> oh God, here he comes again. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Mickey, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, beautiful presentation. One of the comments on the Zoom was, I felt like I met Sister Thea personally tonight oh, wow. through Good. your words and your message. So Can't beat that. You. Thank you for sharing how she touched your life and your vocation and, and certainly through the art that you brought her message to life for us. Well, thank you for inviting so me here. Yeah. And thanks uh, for the amazing uh, stage direction. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I try to do my best. I try to do my best. Uh, I just want you to look good for, you know, this being recorded. That's right. Jersey. That's Maybe right. Yeah. Oh, God, don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our evening tonight. We um, are at the end of our time. We are so grateful for all of you who joined, both on Zoom as well as here tonight. Certainly, for those of you here in Grand Rapids,